What's up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Blood on the Razor Wire TV, where we bring it to you real and we bring it to you raw. Got a special guest on today, Barry. He's been through some things, been in federal prison a couple times, served a bunch of time. You might have seen him on the Oprah show, I think. You might have seen him some other places, too. But anyway, Barry, tell the people who you are, where you're from, and let's get into your story, brother. Great. Thanks for having me, Chad. Barry from L.A. Uh, did two bits spread out by 16 years. So I was a first time offender twice, but not really. Uh, did time in uh, from L.A., did time in T.I., Inglewood, Lexington, Atwater. But uh, good to be on the show. Thanks for having me. Well, I appreciate you coming on. You know, you're from California. You end up going to federal prison way back then. But you go to federal prison in a, you know, in a day and time when, you know, things were serious. The Aryan Brotherhood was around, the Mexican Mafia, a lot of different, you know, gangs, organizations, all of that stuff. What was prison like for you to walk in there back then? So my Terminal Island, 1988, January, I was there. I was 21 years old. And I, little did I know that I wouldn't get out till I was 29, I was under the old law. And there was no MDCLA. And you might remember, Chad, before all these holding facilities were built, like MCC, San Diego, or MDCLA, uh, prisons like, you know, Terminal Island, then a medium, now, I guess, a low, um, were, uh, you know, kind of rocking and rolling. And and I, there were, even if you were pre-sentenced, you were on the yard with people that were sentenced, even though you were in J1. Well, I didn't last in J1 uh, because of a fluke, which we'll talk about later. I was in the shoe for a year. So from January, uh, and I mean, the shoe in TI was, you know, 24 hour a day, except one hour rack. You know how it goes. Um, and uh, there, you were right. Uh, there was a just the Aryan Brotherhood, a Mexican Mafia, but uh, Black Panthers, uh, Ray Ray Browning was there and Doc Holliday. They were actually huge and helping me adjust to prison. That's another story. But you're correct. It was different. It was a medium. There was no pre-sentence facility like MDCLA, which would open in December of 88. So, you know, I want people to know why you go to prison, what company you founded that, you, you know, you were that dude back then, like everybody's mom wanted a <laughs> carpet clean, right? Tell the people who you are and, you know, kind of like how that whole started your company. I was on the yard in uh, Lexington and somebody said to me, my mom used to show me your book when I was a kid and said, I want you to be just like you. And here we are in the yard and I am just like you. Uh, the uh, I was 16 years old. I started a carpet furniture and drapery cleaning company out of my garage. It had been my part-time job. My mom was a telemarketer at a couple of carpet cleaning companies, you know, calling people up and asking them if they wanted their carpets clean. Big thing back in the late 70s, early 80s. I learned how to, you know, market carpet cleaning, learned how to actually go out and do it on weekends with, uh, as a helper. And, uh, what, when I was 16, I, you know, it became very clear that I, if you weren't the star football player on the football team, or you weren't like, you know, the most good looking guy in the world. And, uh, then, you know, you, you, to get on the map and to get dates and you know how it goes, uh, you probably had to have money. And so, uh, I had a 1972 Buick and we used to call it the bomb and, Nobody would be caught dead in that car. Even my mom kind of like, do I really have to go? Um, so wanted to start a company, not to defraud Wall Street, not to get involved with the uh, Colombo family and uh, Bonanno family indirectly and directly, uh, and not to go to prison for 25 years under the old, because that was uh, my crime. I started on the old. The old means parole. Uh, 87 changed. Um, but that's it started with the best of intentions. And by the time I'm in 12th grade, I have 100 employees, three offices, and the attention of being, uh, you know, this young entrepreneur had it all together was addictive. Uh, so hopefully that answers the question, Chad. Sorry to ramble a little bit there. It's fine. I know that, you know, you're, you're in 12th grade, you got 100 employees, you're doing big things. But I know that before we got on this interview, you had told me about, you know, like this girl that was kind of like, I'm not going out with you with this raggedy ass car and stuff like that, right? Yeah. So, our, okay, I'm going to tell you this, and I don't think I've ever said this publicly, but I'm going to tell you, uh, the girl was Lisa Petro. She ended up marrying Mark Gubaza, who was a World Series pitcher for the uh, Kansas City Royals. And I'm at Fox doing a show years ago, like 2008, and I see Mark, and I told him the story, and he just laughed, and I sent him a book, and he was great. 
And and I said, you know, if your wife would have dated me in high school, I wouldn't have ripped off Wall Street for 26 million. But anyway, it was this blonde cheerleader I had a crush on. Very nice gal. She was a year older. But, you know, nobody's going to cut dead with the guy from Reseda with the broken down car and no money. So I was trying to put myself on the map. Then I could get enough money. Then perhaps she'd go out with me. But uh, I ended up marrying better. So that was good. And uh, Lisa and Mark are doing great. And, and he laughed when he heard the story. So, you know, I asked you that question because, you know, there's a lot of people tuning in that, you know, they always think like these rich people ain't shit, but you came from, you came from the ground where, where it was a struggle. Your mother was a telemarketer and, you know, you were poor. You knew what it was like to be poor. And eventually your company is what, worth 300, what, 300 million? Yeah. I'll tell you something, Chad, uh, the loneliest moment in life for me and my sisters, uh, I have two older sisters. Great. I had a great family. My parents were great. My dad may not have set the world on fire economically, but I have no excuses for my criminal behavior for my mom and dad. They were absolutely fantastic. I love, uh, they both passed away. So no excuses, great family. Uh, but here's what happened. I'm in ninth grade going to Northridge Junior High and our water gets turned off. And I have to ask my friend if I could spend the night at his house to get a hot shower. So did my sisters, uh, the, the, the heat. So the water would be cold, just not hot. And we had to get temple handouts. We, we uh, went to a, a local synagogue there and they gave us, clothes. And I just swore that no matter what, I wasn't going to be, even though my dad was a great guy, I just didn't want to be poor. Uh, it, broke ass is not how it's going to go down for me. Everything was on the table. I knew what it was like to be embarrassed and call. I remember Tony Seco, Tony, can I come spend the night? Uh, I made up some lie. Uh, uh, it, it was just hard. So we were from Reseda. We, um, you know, probably the only broke Jewish family in all of the Valley, that was us, but great, you know, again, just because my dad went to every football game, baseball game, basketball game that I was at. So uh, what he lacked in one area, financial stability, he more than made up as a dad, but still, Chad, I wasn't going to be broke. Everything was on the table. I was, had nothing. And by the time in 1987, you can Google this, USA Today did an article and uh, and it said, uh, happy birthday, Barry Minko. Your stock in Zebra Best is worth over 100 million. This is $1987. And the company was worth 300 million. So that is about the plateau. That's his, the height. The stock opened three shares and a warrant for 12 bucks, went to 80. Now, the mob was involved secretly, but I voluntarily were was in those relationships. Nobody ever forced me. All of them, uh, you know, none of them went to prison because of me. Uh, none of them were ever indicted. I was the head guy. Four and a half month trial, got 25 years. But the the interesting thing, Chad, was uh, the transformation of, I get a diner's club card. Uh, I'm 16, but because I had a business open, they accidentally sent me a diner's club card. When I started taking people to dinner, including all the cool high school, Cleveland high school people that are in 12th grade, and I was buying I was always invited. So I quickly uh, put together that as long as I'm buying, people will accept me and love me and uh, wrong mindset. Uh, but that's kind of the answer. Did you ever, you know, when you started getting all that big money, did you ever kind of look down on people that were struggling? Were you like, you know, I'm that dude now, like, who yeah. are you bum to me, a peasant? Dude, I, I'm i ashamed to admit that, but and it feels yeah, I'm on my way to wherever you're at. I'm about to f you up, man. No, I'm just playing with that. <laughs> I, I, I'm ashamed to admit that because you, you're correct. I remember, this is much to my shame, I would pull up in my Ferrari. In 85, I got a 308. In 86, I got a Testarossa. And then got indicted, had to sell it to the lawyer. And then eight months later, the guy dies and it's worth triple. I'm like, really? I can't do anything right. Anyway, so I had the 308 at the time. And I would pull up to somebody, Chad, and look over and they'd be in a, you know, a, a beat up old car, whatever it was. And I'd say, dude, what's wrong with you, man? Why don't you have your together and work? I mean, how could you be satisfied? And the mistake I made, and when I hear it today on social media from people, whenever you equate your value based on what you can do instead of who you are, it's over. It's only a matter of time. And so not only is you are you correct in how I looked down and thought I was better because of what I overcame, but I quickly concluded, and this is more, you know, mentally, philosophically, listen, you're only as good as what you can do, how much you make, 
how big your house is. I had a Z on the bottom of my pool. I was behind the gates at Westchester County uh, Estates, living down the street from Heather Locklear and Tommy Lee at the time. So you're only as good as what you can do, not who you are. That's a doomed by design model. Definitely agree with that. So anyway, you're a young man. You're on your way to federal prison, right? You end up getting busted, involved with the mob at this time, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, two families. Yeah. And uh, there's only one group of people still alive that I don't mention by name. Everybody else has passed away and nobody uh, was indicted. And of course, the statues. But I still won't mention two particular people who are uh, still involved in the life and out of respect. Well, go ahead and mention them on Blood on the Razor Wire, man. Let's get that exclusive mention. I'm just yeah, no, I don't want to. Let's just say that uh, I was shocked to see that the, the him and his brother were still around. But uh, they always treated me great. I will say that. But um, when you see, here's the thing, Chad, the reason I got involved with the mob, it was very indirectly. It wasn't like they have a yellow page ad, but nobody was financing a 17 year old carpet cleaner because you're not even allowed to sign on a business checking account until you're 18 in California. I was 17. I'd dress up in suits, hope they wouldn't catch me, try to look older. But nobody was going to lend on carpet cleaning equipment and a 17, 18 year old. So nobody, I, financing was tr problematic. So I went, my uncle uh, had a, a townhome project called Top of the Mark on Hatteras Street. He goes, Barry, I got to have you go fix this guy's carpet. He's a real, I'll never forget this, mafioso. His name is Jack Catane from Chicago. He's Frank Nitty's cousin. Now, what you got to do is don't talk to him. Just get it done. I don't want this guy complaining. And I said, I got you. On the way there, Chad, I'm like, mob well they lend money and listen i had already determined that my worth if z best fails and every week meeting payroll was a bitch if z best fails it's over for me i have no life i'm nothing so everything was on the table as i indicated so i went to katane's townhome met his wife phyllis and um he brought down an article from the herald examiner no longer in existence with my picture he says, you're the whiz kid. And I said, well, I don't know about that. Wait till the carpets are done. Then he could tell me. He goes, no, I know your story. He goes, I used to run Rusco Industries, Wall Street public company until I got indicted for the Ram stuff, uh, scalping tickets. So anyway, he, um, we talked and he introduced me to somebody who gave me a $25,000 loan, $12.50 a week interest only in a brown paper bag on Lindley and Sherman Way. I'll never forget it. You pay the juice. Keep it as long as you want. Don't miss payment. And uh, it was, uh, I'm in high school doing this. And then it only escalated from there as they saw my ability to grow the company and potentially Wall Street. You know, I want to talk a little bit about your, we're going to get into Sam Bankman Freed too. I want to talk a little bit okay. about that yeah. guy. We will talk about him in a minute. They're, I mean, they're trying to get 100 years out of this kid right now, um, according to the PSR. But I want to ask you this, you know, being from California, you know, you're in that terminal island. You're, I mean, you're in the county kind of over there, right? A lot of gang influence, you know, white car, you know, you're going to follow us. What was it like for you? I mean, did they put the press on you because you're from California, young dude on your way to federal prison, bunch of money probably hidden. That's probably what they're thinking. What was it like, <laughs> you know, to be around ABs and dudes like that? So if you're talking about TI in 88, um, because I wasn't on the yard for that long because I was in the shoe, but in the shoe, um, everybody really got along and they weren't kind of on that because we were all like locked in, you know, all the time. So we all got to be, you know, to the extent, pretty good friends. But I would later learn when I went to Inglewood. Now, Inglewood today is a low Inglewood Federal Prison in Colorado. But in then 88, it was a youth act. So it was rock and roll. In 89, it was a medium. And I had 25 years, went to trial, got convicted and went to Inglewood. And it was kind of on that kind of time where, you know, there's this segregation by race uh, there. And it was new to me because look, uh, full disclosure, uh, I, I make no apologies for absolutely, uh, you know, having some, some of my best friends, any race, it never mattered to me. And that was evident early on. And the ABs checked me more than once. And when it got to Lexington, it got really bad because I, my, uh, my in Inglewood at a medium, my cellmate was an African-American man whose son I'm still in touch with to this day. 
and and I you know loved him and we were the best of friends. So that was kind of unacceptable in a medium in 89, 90, 91. But they gave me a pass because, well, he's a Christian guy. He does walk the talk and, you know, truth plus time equal trust. And we kind of see his lifestyle. So we're going to give him a pass. You know, it, it, it was kind of, it was bad. But the I'm telling you, the, the, the ABs at the time really struggled with me because of the Christian walk, not joining their car. I was a big guy. You know, I was in my 20s. I was always weightlifting and certainly on steroids when I came in, but still maintained a lot of strength. They had weight piles indoor and outdoor at Inglewood at the time, second floor auditorium yard. And so guys were training. That was all, I was all about it. And I gained a lot of respect on the yard for that. So I got a pass, but the ABs had nothing to do with me and really said, you know, uh, we're not happy. And then it would only get worse on the second bit in, uh, in, in, in Lexington. Yeah. We'll discuss that part in a minute. Let me ask you this, you know, being a young man, you're sentenced to 25 years, right? At what, 21 years old? Yeah. Yes, sir. You just had all kinds of money, do whatever you want, drive what you want, spend time with, you know, probably some pretty nice and affluent women back then. What's it like to be 21 years old and get more time in prison than you've been alive? What did it feel like inside? So, well, then you put it that way. I never really thought about it that way at the time. That's a good analogy, actually. Um, I always knew I I was under the parole system. So full disclosure, Chad, nobody thought, I didn't think, you know, 25 was really, and my lawyer was saying, you're going to get out in a third. The guidelines are 40 to 52 months under the old for a first time nonviolent white collar offender. You're good. It's just a lot of publicity. You're going to get out in a third, blah, blah. So that was my mentality, full disclosure. But I will say this, um, when I went to, uh, at, at 21, I was sentenced after trial in, uh, 1989, and you're correct, it was devastating. Uh, March 1989, I was sentenced Judge Trevisian, who's actually a friend to this day, because he became very good friends with my lawyer, David Kenner, who represented Snoop. So at David's 80th birthday party, Snoop's there, I'm there, my judge is there, my judge looks to my wife and says, can you keep him out of trouble? please. Uh, he's a great guy. And, and, and I was blessed to be able to get together with the federal judge who gave me 25 years. But I, I think Chad, that uh, at that time it was daunting. Yes, but I was young. I didn't have kids. Huge. Uh, that was big. And I, um, I was guilty and I knew I had it coming. So I wasn't tripping because I was like, you know what, I'm going to get out in the third. Cause I'm a first time offender. I got my whole life ahead of me. So I don't want to fail jail. So when I went in, they had Pell Grants. You remember, look at me, you know, 89, 99, I got a bachelor's and a master's fully accredited school, got out, got a second master's. So I didn't want to fail jail, leave the same way I came. And so, yes, it was devastating, but it was under the old, under the new, you're hit. It's 22, right? You're doing 85% before the, the Trump law of 20, whatever it was. I'm talking about that, that time it was over, man. It was, you're doing 85% and there was no love in the feds. So I miss that. Money's worth three hundred million. They say you're worth a hundred million. How much money? Right. Do you feel, man? So here's the thing, and I'm going to tell you this: I spent on houses and cars, and um, the government, to their credit, in my pre-sentence report, even though I went to trial, did agree to write Mr. Minko, and this is how I got out in a third: has no money hidden or otherwise. It was Jim Asperger and Gordon Greenberg, U.S. attorneys. They wrote that in there because they knew it's true. 300 million, 100 million on paper. Had I survived, Chad, until this was the cure, every Ponzi scheme, every financial fraud, we have a cure. We're not stupid. We want to sleep at night. We want our kids to be proud of us. We're not idiots. So in our minds, we've conceived a cure to get out of the fraud, pay everybody off and go legit. Me, it was selling my free trading shares at ZBest. I had 6 million shares. They were 18 bucks a share. After two years, December 86, all I had to do was survive till December 88, and I could sell a million shares at 18 bucks a share. That's 18 million I wouldn't have to pay back, pay off the mob, pay off most of the Ponzi, and go legit. In July of 87, uh, I, I fell and went bankrupt. I didn't make it. So that was the cure. So my, my wealth was tied to my stock. Yes, I did borrow against the stock, a couple mil, but I never liquidated it. So when the stock went to zero, so did my net worth uh, very quickly. Keep it real, man. I got two big questions for you. Did you have yeah. a shovel? 
Keep it real, man. It's long over. Keep it. No, no. I wasn't that smart. You, you mean like hidden money? No, no. The reason the government agreed to that, because you have to understand, I'm 2021. I'm with the mob. I'm not hiding anything from them that I do financially for fear of repercussions. But even more important than that, I never plan on failing. What do I need to hide money for? I remember, Chad, this dude in April of 87, this great, brilliant financial guy analyst comes in. He wants to manage my money. Here's where you know you're in trouble. This is a great test for anybody listening. Here's when you know it's over. So this guy comes into my home in Westchester County, 5,000 square foot, Z on the bottom of the pool. And he says, Barry, I want you to diversify. I want you to put some money away. You have all your eggs in the Z best basket. And he starts going over these brilliant investment strategies. You know what I'm thinking, Chad? If you only knew. He doesn't realize I'm kiting checks. I'm running a Ponzi scheme. I'm lying about what I owe. I'm lying about what I earn. I don't have the wealth he thinks. And when, when you are sitting, listening to advice that you cannot take, not because it's not good advice, but because the guy who's giving it doesn't know your whole story and you can't tell him because you'll go to jail, it's over. So he said that, so yes, I should have planned and, but I never thought it was going to fail. And if you were to tell me, we literally had a mindset all in until the stock becomes free trading, then the cure. So I was surviving to the cure, not trying to, what, put a hundred grand away, put 200 grand away. It, It wasn't in the cards. It was all in survive, sell my free trading shares, go legit. That's the lie. The irony is of being a, a fraud perpetrator is we are our own biggest victims mentally. Let me ask you this, right? Because I've been around some people like Jim Nicholson. He had the thing yeah. in New York. Um, I was in prison with Jim. I hope someday he gets out. Had the big Ponzi scheme. Why do all these, <clears throat> so to speak, rich white people, right, go to trial? I mean, it's with other offenses too, like when the principal's doing some things at the school he shouldn't be doing. Why do these people always want to go to trial when they know they're guilty? Is it because they have to save face, like show their in hopes of, hey, I'll be acquitted so people don't think I'm this piece of shit because I'm the substanding citizen and I got kids and I got this beautiful home? Why do these people always go to trial? You know what? That is a great question. Now, you got to remember, Chad, when you and I are in or when I'm in the first time and then most of the second time, uh, the 99% conviction rate was very compelling. Uh, and so a lot of people just pled out and, and because of bad lawyers and, and, you know, ripoffs on that side, that's a whole nother uh, thing, but you are correct. Let me give you a case study that everybody can confirm what you're saying to be true. The Chrisleys, Chris Chrisley. Now, no hater towards Mr. Chrisley or his family. I wish them well. I, I hope he gets out early, but there's a lesson to be learned there when he had a falling out with his business partner. He was bitter and awful. When you're a crook, we always handle people. We'll take it on the chin. We'll eat humble pie, but we're not going to let them tell on us. So we keep them close and paid. Even if they quit, never do we with somebody who knows where the uh, bodies are buried uh, speaking, would we let get in an argument with them or a fight with them and let them leave bitter because they'll, they'll, they'll tell. So he makes the number one mistake of criminals of falling out amongst thieves with somebody who knows it all and dared him to do something. So the guy tells and the feds pick it up. And then the second mistake is he listened to his lawyer about going to trial. When you know you're guilty, here's the thing about men. We have the amazing ability to compartmentalize lying, living a double life. And I can speak from experience. I could be a pastor, preach a great sermon on Sunday and live a double life uh, uh, Monday through Saturday and not and just realize that it's what i have to do the the men who love loyalty man loyalty to the core man he's loyal and they're cheating on their wives never make the connection loyalty is your most coveted characteristic in somebody's uh, uh, somebody you meet somebody you want to get close to and yet you cheat on your wife but that doesn't count we can compartmentalize that in like manner we can convince ourselves well, we're not as bad as Joe. He did a bigger fraud. He got off. He got less time. The government's selectively prosecuting me. How he went to trial and then brought the wife is beyond comprehension because at least you plead to save the wife. Okay, you know how that goes. You know, I'm, yeah, yeah, I'll take the hit. Let me do five, eight at a camp and, and she's off. But I don't. we get deceived by lawyers who want fees. Uh, we believe our own lies. We compartmentalize our deception 
And I speak from experience across the board because I went to trial the first time. The second time, the government's like, hey, you did insider trading. You took this information from law enforcement. You opened another account in somebody's name and traded. And I said, yeah, but I didn't make any money. And the U.S. attorney looks at me and said, Mr. Miko, just because you're a lousy trader doesn't mean you're not guilty of insider trading. I said, you got a good point there. Where do I sign? So, you know, what I mean? <laughs> it's, that's how it goes. But people know you get out of you eventually get out of prison. How much time do you do straight on that first bid before you actually walk out the door? So the judge, I got parole after seven and a half years, uh, and the judge actually wrote a letter to to let me out because I had done superior programming. They had those achievement awards back in uh, under the old law. So I'm out in 95, get my second master's in 96, start pastoring in a great church in March of 97 in San Diego. And greatest people, biggest uh, mistake other than uh, biggest, you know, most horrendous thing I've ever done is what happened at that church and its impact on my family, kids, wife, and the church, because they were great. So again, no excuses. Uh, 97, first couple years, okay. Uh, pastoring, love it. And then all of a sudden, you know, an opportunity comes up to speak and do fraud prevention seminars, make some money, that divided mind thing. Money to me is like, you know, alcohol to somebody who's struggling with alcoholism or heroin to, so it's horrible. And you get a double a divided mind. And instead of focusing on a great church and great people who love me and help me, I sold them out uh, slowly. Doesn't happen overnight. Did you ever notice that even at ZBest, my first crime wasn't 26 million. It was a $200 money order. And I didn't get caught and reinforce the behavior. It's always slow. So never yet. Yeah. So what happened was is the uh, duplicitous life continued. The business grew. I started uncovering fraud, and then I made it to sixty minutes because we had uncovered like sixteen cases, financial frauds that the government didn't know about. Went undercover, didn't make a dime, wasn't doing it to cooperate against anybody. It was just I made a headline, and then three more cases would come. So I was more, um, uh, you know, lucky than good. But uh, and and so I, I got addicted to the fame. Uh, the attention. Hey, he's pastor by day, fraud investigator. He's uncovering fraud before the government. All met, all the old, horrible uh, points of similarity in my character came up. And then I got addicted to Oxy and it was over. It was off to the races. Let me ask you this, right? So people know when you're investigating fraud, you're doing this, you know, whistleblower type of thing with the government. What happens is you end up getting some kind of money, right? Because let's say they take so no, Chad, that's that's a great point today. So let me just clarify one thing. Here's the funniest thing. Between 2003, this is a public record because the SEC wrote the judge about it in my sentencing in Miami. Between 2003 and 2010, when I uncovered all those cases, uh, there was no whistleblower programs. It was all for, I never got a dime. Spent a lot of money, uh, you know, but I did get attention. So whatever, no money. And then in 2011, they passed Dodd-Frank, and now the whistleblower comes. So when I get out in 18, it's intact before it wasn't. So it didn't make a dime. You're doing that now, kind of like the fraud investigating thing, right? Yes. So we do do that. Uh, and I got about 14 cases and four of them already been shut down. The guy got sentenced like a week ago, uh, financial fraud cases relating to things that rip off people's uh, elderly people who don't have a chance to make it over again. They are become a priority uh, for us. So uh, th there was one case, 650 million, and and was very fortunate to be a part of that. Um, and again, so it isn't just that since 2018, we had uh, 14 cases, but about four or five have already been shut down. And that leads more people to come to you and say, would you look at this? So uh, it, let, me ask very you, fortunate. let me ask you the question that the viewers want to know, right? Yeah. How much money have you, if you've been paid, have you been paid? Yeah. No, they take five years, bro. I got out in December of 18. My first case was submitted late 19, 2020. So you got it. The clock starts at about five years. And I'm talking about for them to investigate. You hand them a, a roadmap to the fraud. Here's the cooperated evidence. You don't have to believe me. Here's the proof. Here's the accounting. Here's the legal. And then they do their thing. And it takes a year, year and a half. And then after that, like NRIA, for example, you got bankruptcy, you got this victim, you got, the, so it's a five-year process. So if you're doing it to meet payroll, not a good business model. You got to have a full-time job because, but I, you know what? I was talking to my wife about this about a year ago. Uh, and I said, you know, she goes, you know, you do it anyway. Even if you weren't getting the whistleblower, you did it before. The only difference is those freaking title searches 
to prove double pledging a collateral or whatever are expensive. So out of pocket, you know, usually it's just sweat equity. Lately, it's a little more, but all good. Um, eventually, it'll come. Got a great whistleblower lawyer, and uh, they'll, they'll take care of it. But it's like a retirement. What do you think you're waiting on right now? What's What, what do you think you're waiting on money-wise? You know, there's really no way to tell because the SEC's whistleblower law, and it's a whole other subject for another time, is very uh, tricky in that if you go in and get a temporary restraining order against a fraudulent company, good. If they're bankrupt, then you're just a secured creditor and you got to wait. So there's so many unknown variables until it's resolved, but we're in good position. Listen, for me, worst case scenario, people stopped getting ripped off and increased the likelihood of recovery. And, and, and that's, 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 and, and, and that's good. Um, and then if money comes later, great, but right now, no. Uh, and we've done 14 cases and four or five have already been shut down. So imagine my frustration, but I'm not, I'm not tripping. I'm good with it. And um, the, the point is, is that, and we do the one minute fraud show. It's fun. I get to do it with my son and uh, rebuilding that relationship has been terrific. And, and we could talk about cases and we try to educate Gen Zers on social media before they put their money into something, what to look for so they don't get defrauded. Let me ask you this, right? Because you talked about, you know, your integrity and going to trial back then and you didn't tell on anybody, but now you're this fraud investigator. People are getting arrested. I mean, do you feel in your mind like you're hot? Like you're, I mean, how do you feel about it? So Chad, that's a great question. I, if I may share something with you and I use proper nouns because I'm 57 and I don't want people to say, well, I have to believe Barry. So I'm going to go ahead and mention some names uh, that are easy to verify. This story is critical. Uh, you're correct. Uh, uh, no, because, and let me tell you why. Short answer is I'm not cooperating to get out of trouble or as a co-defendant or co-conspirator. So any snitch things off the table because there's no benefit to me to tell on somebody for my betterment in a legal position of something I'm guilty of. So that's off the table, but you're correct. And let me tell you why you're correct. Worst weeks of my life. It's December, 2011 FMC Lexington, where you went to, when you went there, it wasn't 2000 people, but it was overcrowded. Look at the dates, 2000 people. There may have been over 2000 people when I was there. Oh, I didn't know that it was still that crowded. When you were there, stops, people sleeping on top of each other, people coming to the jail, no beds. I mean, and then when yeah, and, and, and that creates a very we got rocked worse than probably anybody, despite the fact that the place in Ohio was on the news. We got rocked, and then they started moving everybody over to Yazoo, which is probably one of the worst prisons in the country because the staff are absolutely scumbags at Yazoo. But go ahead, yeah, uh, the medium there, and that's where Nap went. So let, let, let me tell you so, article comes out. 12 page front story, fortune magazine, uh, never should have done it. Uh, bad advice, but anyway, came out in like December, 2011 and they throw me in the shoe. Cause it's a big deal. Everybody's still getting magazines back then. It was before really social media took off. And, um, in it, it disclosed the Lennar insider trading case. And it also disclosed my work on covering financial frauds. No big deal because they were totally separate. Meaning there were no co-defendants in the Lennar case. It was just me, nobody to tell on. I got the time. Same with the church thing, commingling. No co-defendants, just me. So it's over about the whole telling thing on that. But the uh, point was, and it, it is the article came out and showed that I was uncovering fraud for the government substantially. It was on 60 Minutes. And so I, uh, they come to me and they say, you got to sign a piece of paper to get out of the shoe, the SIS guy, the lieutenant. I said, I'm happy to. He goes, listen, anything happens to you, you, you it's on you. I said, no worries. I have friends. Dude, the uh, mob contingent there, which you know who they are, because I, I know you know at least one of them uh, they, that were there at the time. And the white boys were like co completely turned on me. They, if they didn't like me, they hated me. And it was getting a little like I went to I switched from Antaeus to Cardinal. And um, there was a man named Isaac Knapp. 20 years Angola State Penitentiary, Golden Glove boxing champ, got out for a murder he didn't commit after serving 20, went back in for drug deal that he did. He was on his last five when we met. We bonded, we became friends. He came to me, I was helping him with his book. And when I got out, he said, um, he saw what was happening and he literally took me, Chad, to each unit and said, this is my buddy, Barry. Uh, he's not a snitch. A snitch is somebody who goes uh, and tells to lower his sentence 
He wasn't involved in any of that. It was his job as an investigator. He probably saved your grandma money. So if you want to see him, you see me first. Bro, it was over after that point. He's still around. He's on my Facebook. We talk all the time. He's in uh, New Orleans to this day, teaching people how to box. He's the greatest guy. Them and the church I was at, a lot of friends there stood by me and made it through it. But it was tense times because there were people who looked at me like, you know, you did the unthinkable and it was a very difficult time. So you are correct. And it was, you know, listen, I don't care how tough you are, how much muscles you have. You go to prison, <laughs> all that, uh, it's it's five on one, three, two on one would have been, one on one would have probably been a problem. So you know what I'm saying? It's just, you know how it is tough thing that don't fly. There are rules you have to abide by respect codes. And I always tried to do that. And, uh, but that was a scary time. Let me, let me stop you for a second, because, you know, your definition might be different than a lot of convicts definition, because they're probably looking at you like you've done a bunch of time, you were convicted before, and then you go home and become a cop, so to speak. I'm not targeting you. I'm just telling you what the yeah. convict mind is and the convict perspective is. So, when the, you know you say, well, you know what, I wasn't doing it to get out of jail. I mean, that's kind of like some people are like that's a people are gonna watch this show and comment saying it's a bullshit answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. Hey, listen, if that's listen, completely guilty on all counts of uh, leaving prison, pastoring a church, uncovering fraud, receiving nothing for it in benefit. So if they could say that if they want, but then got greedy because there are no excuses. There is no because did insider trading, but I was out for 16 years and then went back in and had no co-defendants and absolutely the right to say the guy, you know, in my book, as I define, let me just tell you something, Chad, I'm not on that kind of time. I wasn't there. I walked with my head up high when people, I'm going to tell you something, the baddest dude at Lexington that I knew other than Andre Jenkins, who was a dear friend, uh, came to me. It was given my biggest problem until he did an emotion done. Cause I did everybody's writing for free. I, I love to write. I wrote books. I never charged, never had a hustle. So was the person, was it Charlie? I have no comment. And how in the world would you did, listen? We were, yeah, I, I left in 2015, 14. You left in when? Left in 2020, but Charlie had been there for like 20 years. Yeah. Years. And he, he was definitely somebody who didn't like me. And here's what I think about Charlie. Here's what I think about Charlie. Loved him, totally respected him. You don't have to like me. Uh, and I liked him, he, him and Ed, uh, Ed used to wrestle and, and Ed, Ed Murray was a good friend of mine, African-American guy. And Charlie's a stand up dude. I totally respect him. He didn't like me. Didn't like, he, he took that view that you had. And guess what I have to say about that? Love him, praying for him. I'm not tripping. I'm not that on kind of time. And I'm not going to spend any time trying to convince him, but I will say this. There were people who were antagonistic who a year later, two years later, when they needed something, they came quietly and I was more than happy to help and and actually became friends. So truth plus time equal trust, uh, especially in prison. It's your lifestyle. It's those times on the softball field, football field. You're not cussing. You're helping people. Uh, that I kind of tried to walk that talk. Nobody's perfect and certainly not me. But Aaron, uh, me for the haters, they're going to be haters and would never try to defend. And Charlie's 100% right for thinking what he thought about me to this day and would have nothing negative to say about him. The bigger question is this though, right? What does it feel like to be in prison and have that label for them couple of weeks where you're like, you're going yeah. through emotions. I know that you're probably scared. You're like, damn, what's going to happen to me? So, you know, what I'm really trying to say is that this is the reality of federal prison that people don't understand, right? You always hear the stories, oh, they're checking paperwork. How, you know, someone made a comment the other day, how could they make it? You know, sometimes when you're in a low, you're in a medical, you know, FNC Lexington had dudes in there that had life that were there on medical. Some guys were like, yo, I got life. I'm from the pen, but I don't want to live that life. I really just want to relax while I'm here. So, you know, it could be a dangerous place, but, you know, lows, camps, you know, things like that. Some FCIs, people make it no matter what they've done. Right. But in your situation, I think worse than, you know, because you're, you're at a, you're really at a low and you're probably safe no matter what. People just run their mouth. They don't really do much. But the embarrassment you know, of walking around and having that label and people are like, oh man, that dude's a piece of, you know, don't talk to that dude. Dude's a, in your mind, man, what, how do you feel inside? Like, are you struggling with this? Yeah. So I don't know how it was when you were there, Chad, and you're, you know, more than I do. But when I was there, there was no shortage of violence. 
Um, they were, you know, they were, they had their fights, not anywhere. It wasn't big Sandy, but because it was the medical hub, right? Everyone went to Duke. You had USP people, you had every level. So FMC Lexington meant any level could be there, but you're right. They didn't stay there or nor were they designated there, but there was plenty of, you know, real violence, but um, not near in terms of frequency as you're used to. But for me, I'm going to tell you what happened during those three weeks. You're right. It w I wasn't worried about the embarrassment of the pride because when you're the senior pastor of a church and you fail publicly and you're embarrassed in every newspaper again, uh, like I was at Z best member, New York times, wall street journal, carpet clean. King is a loser. Police learn how mob moved in on Minko. You can Google that right now and it'll come up. So a question about involvement with the mob. The other thing is, after being publicly embarrassed, it wasn't that. I believed, based on where I was at and when I was at, that it, it really could be something that I I might have to you know get down. Yeah, but you know, you got no choice there, right? So, and I felt kind of outnumbered, and I was shocked that the article had evoked that kind of reaction when it was pretty slam dunk. Here's the truth: I went to trial for four and a half months, not because I was a stand up guy or felt threatened or not threatened by the mafia. I did it selfishly because I wanted to finesse my way out of a fraud ticket and thought I could talk my way out of anything. So I got way too much credit for being a stand-up guy. But the truth was I went to trial because I didn't want to spend 20 years in prison because I thought I could talk my way out of it. And I was doing really good up until cross-examination. Then all the lies came out. So fast forward to this incident. Here's what I learned. I learned who my real friends were on that yard and you're going to be shocked. And I'm going to tell you there, obviously the, the Christian brothers there were great, but the Puerto Rican guys invited me to their workout car. Now, you know how hard it is in Lexington to get weights. Um, and the African American community, like there were not only not tripping, they're like, Barry's going to teach us how to make money. Barry's been helping us with our stuff. He's our boy. And uh, uh, a couple of them came up to me and said, don't you worry about anything. If you have any problems, you just come to me. I was shocked. So I had always been kind of a guy who just, you know, didn't trip on anybody's backgrounds, but even more so that Puerto Rican car, they used to just call me Nadis, which means nose. And they used to say, come on, Nadis, lift the weights. But I was big and I knew a lot about waves. I think so there's value there, but they embraced me. Same with the African-American community, the church community. To this day on my social media, many of those guys are there and I'm grateful for them. And it showed me who my true friends were. And that's what happens when the chips are down in your life, when the tide of popular opinion turns against you, even because of a self-inflicted wound. Chad, I can't speak for you. Every problem I've ever had in my life of significance is because of a self-inflicted wound. Me. Not I can't blame you, family, background, the persecution in prison, the government. I'm so tired. Me. So hopefully that answers the question. I agree with you. You know, I just think that, you know, when you got that, you know, there's people walking around talking bad about you. It hurts inside. You're embarrassed. You're afraid. Yes. You're like, damn, man, ashamed. Um, and you try to convince yourself in your mind, like, hey, yo, this is what it is. But another reality of federal prison, because you mentioned it, right? This is the reality. And I've seen this done plenty of times. By, you know, whoever. White dudes have done it to white dudes. Black dudes have done it with white dudes. I mean, I was in uh, Ray Brooklyn, you know, the the um, the rabbis all got arrested for that big, you know. I heard about that. So there's dude, the rabbi comes in, he's at Ray Brook, this dude, black dude from Jersey, scoops him up. And, you know, right away, you know, we're in an FC, we're in FCI. <clears throat> Ray Brook is kind of a dangerous place at times. But he scoops the dude up and he's like, Pay, the dude's paying him, right? He's, and he's like, man, it's my buddy right there. Really, this dude's not your buddy. He's taking your money and, and he's acting like he's protecting you. And he probably will. And, and then some people from Jersey were like, yo, bro, like, what's up with you, man? Like, that, you know, that's over with. And the dude ended up going up top, the rabbi. But anyway, some people will watch the video that been to federal prison. Some white dudes are probably pissed watching you say that. Um, but do you think that some of these dudes really weren't your friend? It was about what you could do for them. So therefore, in response... They wanted to protect you. And I'm going to give you an example. The mayor from Connecticut. Um, I mean, he was a real piece of work. Uh, Philip Giordano, like doing some vicious, vicious stuff to kids. And he had some New York dudes like protecting him because he was doing their legal work for free, trying to help him get out of jail. And he did some really bad things. There may have been some friends in there, but do you see it as some of them dudes really weren't your friends? It was about, hold on now. 
It was about what you could do for them. The same thing with the white dudes that, you know, were talking shit about you and disliked you. But now all of a sudden they come to you when they need something. You're like, oh, yeah, he's, he's an all right guy. But really, he wasn't an all right guy. Really, he wasn't. You're, you're saying that now in retrospect. But really, that dude wasn't an all right dude. That dude was out to get you, defame you, disrespect you. And now because he needs you, you want to look at it like, you know what? He's an all right guy. I mean, your perspective. So I, I have to say this, Chad, that I've been pretty much um, someone who um, has not been truthful. I, I, uh, I, I remember telling a dear friend of mine at Lexington, I said, you know, the truth about me is I'm a very deceptive human being. And um, I, I, I can, I have the unique ability to, to say something and be convinced that it's true and then, and then do the opposite. And I'm perhaps I'm not alone there, but in this regard, it wasn't that they were, uh, that I, I even, you know, Lexington, it wasn't like I even needed protection. I needed affirmation support and that the, <laughs> It's okay, baby. <laughs> sorry about the cat. <laughs> so, uh, sorry about that. So it wasn't that I, you know, needed protection or anything like that because, you know, I was on the yard and, uh, in, in, and was, you know, pretty good shape at the time, but, uh, and, and certainly didn't have, you know, uh, wasn't antagonistic towards anyone, but I, it was the, you're with me. I got you. I support you. I don't believe the hype. That was more valuable to me than, Here's soups. You're going to protect me. Walk me to the commissary. No, none of that. Um, so that was valuable. It was the affirmation I expected from the church community. The you know, the, the, Jeremy Grammer was a guy in Lexington. He did way too much time. He was a cop, uh, and he knew how to handle himself. Um, and guys found out the hard way. He would try to, um, and uh, he taught me something. He said, Barry you need to get back out on the yard. I said, what do you mean? He goes, well, this terrible thing has just happened. You need to get back out of the yard to show that it doesn't matter. You're not tripping. You're not afraid. And you're going to do what you always do, weight lift and do what you do. And I never forgot that. And I always tell my kids or anybody, when something bad happens, you need to get back out of the yard. You need to get back to work. You need to get back to training. You need to, don't let an, a, a tragedy, you know, take you off your uh, dream or vision or, or sidetrack you. Uh, or sideline you. And, and so getting back in the yard, having people there that want to be there with them, it was an eloquent rebuttal without words. So that was extremely valuable. And it was far less than my bodyguard, the movie where I'm being walked to this, none of that. So, and you know how that place was. So it ended up, the test would be, are any of them there now? And, you know, Isaac Knapper and I are, are friends to this day as are uh, others. And so I would say it passed the test of time and uh, I'm grateful for their love, help, and support at, at a very low moment in federal prison. Let me say this, right? I'm a firm believer that you can't fix something if you don't face it. Cedric Dean taught me that many years ago. Another good friend of mine who's African-American brother, just, just he taught me a lot. And he used to tell me, man, you know these dudes in here? You know, whenever you had an issue, whether it was a beef with someone in prison or a legal issue, you can't fix something you won't face. So you got to face it or else it'll never be fixed. You'll always be running from it. So anyway... You know, I, I mean, I, I understand <clears throat> your perspective and in, in, in what you said. Let's talk a little bit about this cat before we get ready to go, right? Sam Bankman, F Freed, Froud, however the hell you say his name. Pictures surface with him. He's in the county jail with the Bloods. Um, and he's like, yo, I'm with these dudes. Kind of like probably the same thing. You know, some of these New York City dudes, Jersey dudes, they're Bloods. They're like, yo, old boy, man, dude was on the news, yo. You know, he's got that bread. You know, a lot of times people have a hidden a, a agenda, right? I'm just, that's what it is. Um, you can look at gangs like the Dirty White Boys, right? They weren't in there protecting white dudes that just came in. There was a there was an agenda. Yeah. What can you do for me today? What can I take from you? What can I, you know, deceive you for? You know, they were, you know, it, it's done on a different level in prison for four or $500. I mean, you're, you were doing it for millions. So, what you know, when we talk about the little bit of, you know, these guys, you know, like you said, you weren't giving them commissary, but you had something to give. And maybe it was a friendship. Maybe it was, you know, laughter. Maybe it was, you know, hey, just hanging out with you, or you could teach them how to do stocks or, you know, whatever it was. Not saying that every single person that was involved in your circle was using you, but a lot of them, a lot of people, and, and you know, I, I may have be guilty of this before in the past, where, you know, it was, what could you do to benefit me? And I think that that was kind of your situation, not in all respects, but in some. And I think that, you know, you probably would could admit to that. 
Anyway, I'm not here to preach to you, brother. You were the pastor, not me. Um, not a very good one, though. Oh, Sammy boy, he has something to give. These dudes are plotting on him. They think, man, this dude's got something to give. Uh, another example, and, and before we, I should have said this before, uh, the guy out of Texas owned all the banks in Antigua and all of that yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah uh, Sanford, Stanford. Stanford. Oh, so yeah, I was yeah. with Sanford, right? He gets beat up in the county jail in Texas. They have to reconstruct his face. Mexicans jump on him. They want his money. Um, he gets to a prison that I'm at immediately. The white dudes are plotting on him, right? Some real, you know, some real gangsters are like, yo, bro, this is what he's got to come up off of something. He's white. We're taking it. He's, he's got to do something. And you know what, man, that, that was the press, man. They pressed him immediately, man. And he was that dude that sent some money. Right. And he was like, Hey, these guys are my friends. Like we weren't your friend. I mean, these dudes weren't we, whatever it is, right. Whatever group or gang or organization, they weren't his friends. He had something to give. And I think the same thing with Sam Bankman freed or Froud, whatever, you know, he's sitting down there and, and dudes are like, yo, dude's got some money. A couple dudes might actually like him. He might be a funny dude. They think he's got something to give. 100 years. PSR comes back. Let's give old Sammy boy 100 years. What do you think is going to happen to Sam? That's his intended loss, overall loss, all of that. Yeah. Um, I don't know en enough about the case to make any meaningful comment about, you know, what I think deserves or not deserves. But, you know, when you take a macro look at the case and you see it looks like, you know, obviously it was complicit. Um, appears to be, but he, he kind of looks like he was used a little bit, uh, but happy to be used as I was with the mob. It wasn't like he was forced into it, um, became addicted to not the money. It was the influence the money gave him, senators, congressmen, all that stuff. And I empathize with that addictive, uh, you know, power. And I would just hope and pray that they would you know, he'd have, uh, you know, obviously pay for the crime, but also have another shot at it. Um, having, you know, clearly a brilliant guy. Uh, I would, I absolutely as a person, and you would expect me to say this as a Christian, but I believe that, you know, in my case, God's the God of another chance because I've long blown the second, but in his case, he's certainly deserving. He's serving his time. He went to trial. Uh, he's going to learn a lot in prison, but I'm going to tell you something, Chad, I think he has a lot to offer in terms of uh, value of how to protect investors from bad crypto schemes, because it's not going anywhere. And so I think the government should see him for some value in helping protect investors. He doesn't have intel on perpetrators. He's been out of the game too long, but he does have intel on how to level the playing field. And if the SEC is trying to regulate crypto as, as a security, there's obviously an interest there to protect the uh, public well, I'm thinking this guy might have some value and you would expect me to say that, but I, I, I'd be all for him getting another chance. It doesn't look that way from the government's perspective on their sentencing memorandum. I mean, on the probation report, his lawyer follows like a hundred page sentencing memorandum objecting to, you know, the hundred years that he's possibly facing. He, I think you hit the nail on the head. He's kind of a goofy looking kid. No, you know, not, not that I'm better than anyone, but and I think he just wanted to be liked. And then he started to, you know, he started to make money, kind of what you were doing with the carpet business, taking the kids out to eat. And now everybody likes you. And, you know, he was kind of like, probably like just, just that weird kid in school. And now you got this thing going on, you're making money. He's probably, you know, for, you know, we keep it real and raw. He's probably banging some chicks. And now he's like, yo, I'm that dude. Um, But I really think he was kind of a goofball. You know, he went to a prestigious school, but, I thought he was kind of a goofball and people were using him and pulling him in this direction, pulling him in that direction. Not necessarily stupid, made some stupid choices. But as far as his hundred years and, and all of that stuff, it looks like they're going to, I think they're going to blast this kid, whether or not they bring him back because they want him to, to help out. But I think they are going to blast him. I don't know if he's going to get a hundred years, but I bet you he's in the 20, 25 year range, depending on, you know, what his judge and his judge is mediocre. Uh, not, not nice, not horrible, but, We'll see what happens. And he's going to end up in a prison where dudes are going to be plotting on him immediately. Yeah, I, uh, I, I just hope for the best for him. I think you, you made some very good points. Um, the, the acceptance, uh, he was the last guy picked on the yard to play on the softball team or baseball team when they had them all lined up. And uh, he was first for a while in the world of finance. That's addicting. There's some mitigating factors here the government ought to consider as well as benefit he can offer 
the investment community. Um, and, and I think, um, yeah, I don't, I don't want to, uh, I, I don't think, I think there's some redeemable qualities there. Listen, man, I appreciate you coming. I'm going to ask you a couple more questions before we get ready to go. What are you doing now to make money? So, uh, do, you know, I have some clients that I actually do some work for to help protect them. Or if they think they've been ripped off, they want me to do some analysis or something. So, uh, small there, but we did, uh, I, I, you know, got together with a, a doc and a guy from prison, uh, a guy's name's Kevin Ackerman, a great guy. And we did squats behind the case manager's office back in the day at Atwater. And, um, you know, I just felt like, uh, you know, I, I do work out a lot and, and, uh, do the keto diet. And here's why that's important for me. When I got out of prison, my kids had zero confidence in me. I left them when they were eight, Chad, I got back there in ninth grade. We were able to finagle a North Hollywood apartment with my sister's co-signature on Tierra Street. It was a two-bedroom, and Lisa accepted me back, so God brought our family together. It was great, my sons. And I said, boys, uh, why don't you work out with me? Dad's going to diet. And when I got out of the halfway house, Chad, everybody gained like 40 pounds because we were eating everything, right? But then January 1, 2019, I said, boys, I'm starting my diet program and and uh, haven't stopped since. And they're like, yeah, sure. So I started bringing them to the gym. And what I learned was uh, not only did my sons and I have that in common that we could do that together, wrapping their knees for squats and they drinking protein shakes, but they saw me not quit. They saw me every day. I had a cheat day. It was either, it was Sunday. So I could eat what I want for an eight hour window. But if it wasn't cheat day, they would not see a cookie near me. And it just doing what I said I was going to do, even in the small things, help rebuild the foundation of my relationships with my kids. Uh, now, uh, they both kind of work out Dylan more than Robert now, cause Robert got hurt, but, um, the, it was, you know, you know, four and a half years of training and, 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 and not lying to them about, you know, what I was going to do to take care of my body in terms of eating uh, more eating healthier. Cause I'm old. And the only thing that grows on me is my nose and my stomach. So I got to watch out. I don't got good genetics. So the, uh, we started a program that just, I noticed that guys my age are just kind of giving up on it. It's, you know, just it's over. They're like, you know, I'm talking about the busters, the 64 to 72 guys old, like me, the stomach and, and, and they defraud themselves. So I'm thinking to myself, these guys use the same techniques that I use to defraud wall street, to lie to themselves about a preventable health condition. So, you know, we wear, uh, black clothes or tooth sizes too big, or we, you know, we can't tie our shoe, can't see our toes, uh, but it's okay. And we'll get on it next week. And all these similar excuses. So I said, look, we'll start a program. It's called it's your stomach. And we just felt like um, it's, it's a program that is not a diet because that has a beginning, middle and end. It's a, a nutrition program and it's a training program and it's cheap and we root you on and encourage you. And we want you to be like Rob Lowe. Like, you know, it's a lifestyle, Terry Crews a lifestyle, no crash, no rush, easy peasy, encouragement, confidence, but don't defraud yourself physiologically is the concept. And if anybody knows about lying to themselves, uh, unfortunately, uh, it's me uh, for all the wrong reasons. So what's the company called? It's your stomach. And uh, we have it on the app store, uh, Apple and Google. And so we have a website and it's a program that will launch you. And here's the good thing. Dude, I am not stupid. The low carb foods today, ketogenic foods, you couldn't do this five years ago. The technology, you could walk in and get nature's own low carb bread at Albertson and you couldn't tell the difference between Wonder Bread, which will kill you with bleached white flour and carbs and nature's own low carb. The products are so good. The Reese's cup, Cups from Quest, the ratio yogurt with blueberries. I mean, no sugar. So look, most of my wounds were self-inflicted. Well, the diabetes is hopelessly preventable, yet it's a self-inflicted wound. And we have many men my age, not your age, you're young, you're, you know, these guys. And I just like, guys, self-inflicted wounds, you can stop it. And by the way, everything from the ice creams to the breads are freaking good, Chad. Believe me, it's not, you can't have this, but not this, but that, and the but that ain't bad. You get a cheat day, it's all good. I'll post your link. People can check you out. I'll tell you this, Barry, in the last three and a half weeks, man, I jumped on that diet and I lost 19 pounds, bro, working out twice a day in the morning and at night. And you know what? I lost 19 pounds in three and a half weeks and I'm still pushing, bro. So anyway, man, 
I appreciate you coming on. Anything you want to say before we go? No, Chad, I, I, I did want to say this. I think that um, what I've tried to do in the world of financial fraud prevention for social media people, that's why we do the fraud minute. And, and uh, you're doing in terms of uh, your ability to uh, relate to people that I couldn't reach and connect with and encourage. So I, I'm not doing it as well as you, but kind of following in your footsteps in a different genre of, of folks that hopefully I can reach, but uh, your uh, reach and impact is significant because if I'm watching this, I'm like, if I thought I'm gonna commit a federal crime and have it easy, I'm not. I mean, you literally are talking people out of without saying one word uh, of ever making my kind of mistakes. Well, listen, Matt, definitely appreciate you coming on. I'm gonna put your links in the description. People can check out your, it's your stomach. And again, man, I appreciate you coming on. Blood on the Razor Wire TV with respect. Until tomorrow, we're out.